Good morning, <clears throat> or good evening, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> my goodness, I don't think I've talked out loud today, so. My voice is a little froggy. It's a beautiful day here, cooler temperatures, and uh, feeling a lot of sympathy and empathy for all for those of you who are in incredibly hot hot weather today we just happen to luck out with some cool weather so today i want to read again from ashinte jania's book this is dhamma everywhere and um, I think these, his books are, are really have become very important to me because his words are so clear. And I think we can read a little bit and then sit together. How's that? So now we're on a different, on a new section. Uh, yesterday I read the uh, the tips, the bullet points at the end of his. Uh, mindful meditation this is called it was called mindful meditation essentials and it was really a good review of what we've been talking about so this is from moment to momentum I'll read it I'll read and then we can sit and when we sit you can just let things be in your mind and no need to think about them but just watch them and uh, we'll use that meditation time to maybe, maybe your mind can digest some things. So in the book, this is page 86, From Moment to Momentum. When people think of meditation, they imagine a yogi sitting with his eyes closed. The sitting posture alone doesn't mean the yogi is meditating. He could be sitting very still, lost in thoughts. So when do we meditate? Do we begin when we get to the Dhamma Hall? We meditate wherever we are, from when we wake up to the time we fall asleep. Can't we also meditate in the shower or washroom? Don't just sit and daydream away on the toilet. Remember to be aware at any time when you are in the Dhamma Hall, on the walkway, while brushing your teeth, washing up, cleaning, taking a shower, reading, talking, hanging clothes, or doing any other daily activity. Since this is a practice we do consistently over the entire day, it isn't necessar necessary to spend so much energy all at once. The mind, however, needs to be awake, alert, relaxed, and balanced as these mental qualities allow wisdom to arise. It is Dhamma only when we learn to meditate, are able to meditate, and continue to meditate. <clears throat> Any object. Observe your body now. What do you observe when you are aware without pinpointing a specific place like the nostrils or abdomen. Know that you are sitting, standing, walking, feeling, heat, feeling heat, hearing, etc. Do you see only when you look? <clears throat> Can you also see without looking? There is the sound of the clock and the sound of birds in the Dhamma Hall. You can hear these without listening. How hard is it to be aware of all these things? Does it take much energy? You only have to be aware like this the whole day. Let me try to get out of the glare. Okay, that's a little better. Please don't think that one object or place is better than another because one object is not better than another object. Objects are objects and they are all just arising according to their own nature. 
As such, it doesn't matter what object you begin with. Start with any of the six sense objects suitable for you. But remember that whatever you begin with, begin with, having awareness and wisdom is what's important. Check the meditating mind. When you put on red tinted glasses, everything you look at will be red. With blue tinted, everything you look at will be blue. Observing objects with greed or aversion is like wearing these tinted glasses. When the observing mind watches with greed, then the objects will be objects of lobha or greed. When the observing mind watches with aversion, then the objects will be objects of dosa. The mind can't see an object as an object or a dhamma object anymore. It's no longer an object because it's clouded with that. It is difficult to see this greed or aversion in the mind when you are very intent on watching objects without seeing what is happening in the observing mind. Is there greed? Is there aversion? It's not what is happening with objects that matter, but how the mind is observing them that is important. Only when the mind in observe, only when, excuse me, only when the mind observes without loba, dosa, or moha, do objects become dhamma objects. I was, try I was hearing voices outside and uh, I was realizing that my mind was hearing them with some aversion. They were getting loud. I thought they would uh, take over and get to my microphone. So that, that caused me to stumble in my speech. <laughs> Only when mind observes without greed, aversion, or delusion do objects become Dhamma objects? Observing naturally. When does the mind feel tightness or tension? There is tension when the mind wants something other than what is happening or when the mind rejects what is happening. Defilements don't want to let things be as they are. They want something to happen. They want results, or they want to control what is happening. And they'll focus, force, create, or restrict to get what they want. Instead of creating, focusing, or restricting, we want to only wait and watch. Is there any need to focus if we let whatever happens, happens? If we are not looking for anything special or specific, we don't want, we don't need so much energy. We only need intelligence and interest. What is happening? How is it working? If we want to observe how something is working naturally as it is, we also have to observe naturally. That's why I say not to control or force anything. We just let the body do its job while we pay attention to the mind and are aware as much as we can be aware consistently throughout the day. So doesn't that seem like a simple, a simple task? And yet how often do we feel like we become mindless? or how often we become distracted. So sitting meditation, so when we're sitting, that's more what we think of as the formal practice. What can you observe? You can observe whatever object that arises. This is when we're sitting. If the mind's attention goes to the nostrils, you can observe that. If attention goes to your hands, you can observe that. You can observe you can observe any of these things as well. 
Are you going to put your attention back at the nostrils if your attention is already at your hand? No. Working to put your attention back at the nostrils when the mind is paying attention to something else is too tiring. What is the difference between the objects at the nostrils and the objects at your hand? There's no difference. What happens when the mind pays attention to the sounds? Meditators would say, we'll become aware of the sounds. Are sounds going to bother you? They shouldn't bother you if you just consider sounds as natural phenomena. You just want to recognize hearing if there are hearing. So when I was hearing those voices and reading at the same time, I was completely distracted because I wasn't hearing the voices as sound. I was hearing them as a version. Lost my place in the reading, everything. When you initially begin meditating, you may find the mind feeling agitated, drowsy, or restless. That's not a problem. In daily life, you've accomplished, accomplished things mainly using defilement-produced mental energy. Here, because you are asked to practice without craving or aversion, the mind initially loses strength and becomes weak. Within a couple of days, as you develop a little more awareness, stability, and calm, you'll find the mind more awake. What will happen when the mind wakes up a bit? You will notice many, many thoughts. But don't worry, this is just nature and not a problem at all. Thoughts may only seem like a problem if you have the preconception, preconception that they are distracting you from your practice and you try to stop the thinking. But aren't thoughts also the mind? If you really want to learn about the mind, these thoughts are showing the way. Can you observe this? So why is there an aversion to thoughts? Meditators might say there are feelings and emotions that come about because of these thoughts thoughts. If that's the case, how are you going to view these feelings? Are they a nuisance? Yes. When you recognize these feelings as objects, then the practice becomes vipassana meditation. That's when the practice becomes insight meditation. When feelings become objects and you can observe those objects. Please don't set your sitting meditation to the clock. If you have determined that you will sit for a set time period, you may begin to worry when you have to break your determination for some reason. The resulting anxiety will destabilize the mind and weaken samadhi. So don't set any special time it's enough to know what is happening in the moment. It's also okay to get up and walk if it is difficult to sit. Just remember to maintain awareness of what is happening in the mind and body. So I know for a lot of us, because of schedules, we sit for a set period of time and he's asking us not to do that. We can begin to have anxiety, being clock watchers, and that anxiety will destabilize the mind and weaken samadhi, which is that stability of mind. It is enough to know what is happening in the moment. Walking meditation. Walking meditation is just like sitting meditation in that you are just aware of whatever is arising or happening. Let the body go in an easy, natural manner. 
Walk in a natural way and at a natural pace. Please don't walk extremely slowly. Don't force yourself to watch objects just related to the body while walking. You will get tense from keeping your attention at your feet for the hour or, or the hour or so that you practice. Just be aware of the body as a whole. If the mind becomes aware of sweating, know that. If it is aware of the hands, know that too. Are your hands clasped? Are they swinging? You can be aware of all of these actions. You can also be aware of what you see, hear, think, smell, touch, or feel while walking. What is the mind aware of? How is the mind? What is happening in the mind? What state is it in? And is it at peace? It's good if you can be aware of the intentions to stop or to move. It's even better if you can recognize why you continue walking. I like that last question. So uh, the last two, when he says, it's good if you can be aware of the intention to stop or to move. It's even better if you can recognize why you continue walking. Eating meditation. Which one should be stronger, the desire to eat or the desire to practice? Greediness tends to come in as soon as a meal begins. Observe the mind first. The eagerness to eat is very strong. <laughs> There's a certain high feeling that accompanies this desire to eat. Awareness is either very weak or not present in the presence of this strong eagerness. How is the mind while you are eating? Is it relaxed? Check regularly that you are not eating with eagerness. The wanting is pretty obvious, and the mind will feel a bit tight when there is a desire to eat. The mind is planning the different ways to combine food on the plate. How will you eat? What will you eat after you finish this portion? The mind is already planning the next scoop. So unless you are paying attention to what the mind is doing, you'll just continue down the path of thinking and planning, motivated by eagerness. Don't be so concentrated on the food or the plate. Instead, continue to observe the mind while you are eating. More and more, try to recognize how the mind is working while you are eating. What state of mind are you eating with? How is the mind feeling? Is it relaxed? Is it intent on eating? When the mind is relaxed, you can observe how you are moving your body. For example, you can observe how you're holding the utensils, touching, opening your mouth, chewing, or breaking pieces apart. You can also know different tastes, like saltiness or spiciness. You can know any or all of these. Can't you also observe what you like and what you don't like? Is being hungry the same as wanting to eat? Being hungry happens in the body. Wanting to eat happens in the mind and is the work of thinking. Sometimes the mental desire to eat and the bodily sensation of hunger become interconnected. You just want to observe these things and everything that is happening as it is. And he's not giving us rules here. He's just asking us to be aware. Daily activities. Meditation doesn't happen only in sitting. How do you get up from sitting meditation to go to your daily activities? 
please get up and go with awareness. As you transition from your sitting meditation to various daily activities, please do not forget this. Be mindful. There ought to be continuity of awareness throughout the day, whether in sitting, standing, eating, going or doing daily activities, making it harder for unwholesome thoughts to enter. You can be aware of what the mind is doing as you go up or down the stairs, as you put your keys in the lock or open and close the door. Do you enter your room with your head first or your feet first? You need to observe yourself in these daily activities. What do you do when you are back in your room? Do you just take your shawl off and toss it on the bed? Continue to be aware of what you can while you are in your room. You can learn from whatever is happening. Every moment is the right moment for meditation. See all the different activities you can be aware of in your daily activities, from washing your face, to brushing your teeth, combing your hair, to changing clothes. Try to be aware of all these things down to the smallest activity. Observing these bodily actions may be dominant in the beginning, but it is important to regularly check the mind as the meditating mind is more important than what is happening in the body. Have interest in whatever is happening and whatever you are doing. You want to know everything about how the mind and body are operating here. Also see what you can be aware of as you go to bed and as you fall asleep. When you wake up, you can be aware of the groggy feeling or wanting to go back to sleep. This is also meditation. What are you aware of the moment you wake up? Is the body on its back? <clears throat> is it on its stomach? What is happening in the body? What is happening in the mind? You're using your intelligence and wisdom and continually sharpening them for the practice in this way by being interested in the process of meditation, in what you are doing, and by asking these kinds of questions. What is this? What is happening? Why is it happening? When you think about your practice and how you are practicing, you are basically filling the mind with wholesome thoughts, making it more difficult for unwholesome thoughts to arise. Meditation is the work of sharpening awareness and developing stability of mind and wisdom. Here are some more questions you can consider. What am I doing? How am I meditating? Am I practicing the right way? How do I proceed? How do I proceed with the practice? In the beginning, you may feel a little tired when you are learning how to practice skillfully. Once you know how to practice with the right attitude, both the mind and body will feel, will feel at ease. That's a wonderful section. The next section is on pain which I know is important for a lot of us because we're dealing with it. But I've used, up, I've used up our time just reading, so let's practice. I'll start the practice with you and hopefully you can continue, even if it's just for a few more minutes. So let's just begin. Let's be aware of the body breathing. Just be aware of your body falling into the right posture because it's used to you doing this. It feels you turn your attention to your breath and the body just will begin to move into the right posture for you. 
whether you're standing or on your back, on the floor or in bed. Be aware of the body, the body breathing for you. Let your hands relax in your lap. Now you can let your focus rest very, very lightly on your breath. If you like, you can start there. And you can practice if you want to today, allowing your object to shift and change depending on where your attention goes. The object is not as important. It's the mind and how the mind is observing the ob object that's important. Can we observe any object without having greed, aversion, or delusion cloud, a, cloud our mind? Always know that if you become overwhelmed or there are too many distractions where you are or you're feeling any kind of uh, stress doing this, you can always come back to your breath. But as your mind becomes more stable, you can let the object become anything in your environment, anything. <coughs> and the object will become just whatever we're observing. We're paying more attention to our mind. Watching for any aversion or that greed, that being pulling, feeling herself being pulled toward something because it's pleasant. Or delusion, which can be confusion or an inability to see something clearly. And the object can also be something in your body.
Now, it's my time to leave, but let me, hopefully I'll leave you sitting or moving into your activities, trying to let carry your meditation with you. Yeah, Lisa's saying she's going to try the mindful eating this way. That's a good idea. May everything we do or say or think today be done not only for our own benefit, but also send it forward, offering it as merit to all sentient beings, all living beings everywhere throughout the universe. May peace be with you. May you be well. <clears throat> may you be contented and truly happy. And may you live in peace. Thank you. And I'll be with you on Sunday again. Thanks. <laughs>